We're going to deal tonight with the fact that as we live in these days that we're in, as we see the world taking sides over political issues, masks, vaccines, a whole lot of other stuff that's going on. I could get into many other things that I could mention. You know what they are. You're watching the news. You're watching social media. The world today, would we not agree, is deciding that if someone doesn't see it like they see it, the other person is their enemy. Would you not agree that's how they're doing it? And they're vilifying and attacking. And folks, let me say this to you in love. I've prayed and prayed and prayed. And tonight's message, I hope you hear, because I've got to say some things tonight that some of you might not like. I hope you know I love you. Hope you've had that proven to you over the years that we've been together. These things should not be in the church. The Bible is very, very clear that in the church, there should be a love one for another. Doesn't the Bible say that that's the evidence that we're his children, our love one for another? But we just assume that since we're family and since we're all Christians and we're all saved, it bugs us when someone might not see things the way we see things. And when I first started preaching, again, over 30 years ago, I was a young, brash preacher that thought I knew best, and I used to make this statement. I would stand in a pulpit at a church when I was 19, 20 years old, and I would say, if you have the same Holy Spirit inside of you that I have inside of me, we should always agree. I mean, didn't that make sense? I mean, if you got the same Holy Spirit living inside of you that I have living inside of me, why would we ever disagree? We should always see things the same way. And I would preach that because it made sense to me, but I didn't have any scriptural backing. I just preached something that I believed enough that if I believed it so much, God had to believe it too. I used to, I mean, you, some of you might know, might know this, some of you might not. Charles Schultz that used to draw the Peanuts cartoons also used to draw Christian cartoons with teenagers. They looked a lot like the Peanuts characters. They were just tall and skinny. And I found this cartoon one time that he had made. And there's a young teenage boy laying on the floor and the Bible's in front of them. And a tall, skinny, loosey looking character standing next to him as she's watching him read his Bible. And what he says to her is, he says, leave me alone. I'm looking for a Bible verse to back up one of my preconceived notions. <laughs> and we have a tendency sometimes to believe something so strongly, we'll even try to find a verse that proves that we're right. But you know, as I grew in my walk with the Lord and I began to read the Bible more as a preacher, I came to realize that all through the scriptures, you'll find lots of times that Christians don't see things the same way and God's okay with it. There are certain things that are the non-negotiables the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, his substitutionary death for us on the cross, that salvation is by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ, and that's all. There are some, there's others, there are some non-negotiables, and there are even things in the Bible that very, the Bible clearly says is sin, and you can see those listed, sexual immorality and drunkenness and, and the Ten Commandments, of course, but at the same time, there are other aspects that come into our lives that the Bible actually shows that not all Christians will see it the same way and some might even change their views over the years as they grow in their walk with the Lord. But you remember that problem I talked to you about last night? That problem that we all have even though we're saved? Remember Adam and Eve were offered, you get to be like God. You get to decide right and wrong, good and evil. We still have that problem in our flesh. And we're going to preach one of the last two messages. I don't know which one I'm going to do first, but of the last two messages, one of them is going to be looking closely at Romans 12, 1 and 2 and the laying of our flesh on the altar and learning how to renew our minds on a daily basis. We have to acknowledge and understand that, folks. Every one of us have opinions. Every one of us have opinions about a lot of different things. And we have to, as believers in Jesus Christ, take every thought and make it captive to the Holy Spirit and allow him to show us what he would have us do with this. And what we're going to do tonight is look at a passage of scripture that deals with the fact 
that Christians aren't going to see things always the same way. And listen closely, God's okay with that for lots of reasons. Before we, though, break down Romans 14, I want to kind of show you something from the scriptures that God has begun to open my eyes to. And maybe if you're honest, you'll allow God to show you that this probably might be true of you as well. But I will make a statement to you about myself and you decide whether or not it fits you as well. I found now at 56 years old that as I look back over my life, whenever I jumped to a conclusion or made a decision about somebody else's life, my first reaction as I look back now, usually was wrong. My first reaction was wrong, and we see it all through the scriptures. Go with me to Luke chapter 9. We'll start in verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. This is the disciples of Jesus. Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. What were they arguing about? Who was the most important? Who was the greatest? And Jesus said, you're looking at it wrong. But you know what? I've seen over the years in the church this mindset of moving up the ladder. When's that youth pastor going to get off his rear end and become a senior pastor? When are we going to, we just assume that there are those who are more important than others. And all through the scriptures, the Bible says God doesn't look at it that way. Actually, Jesus said, when you go into a, a banquet, choose the lowest seat. And if you are to be elevated in the eyes of the people, let the master do that. Don't assume it for yourselves. But our first thought is we want to be the greatest, but they were wrong. Look at, look at the very next verse. Verse 49, Jesus answered, sorry, John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he doesn't follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him for the one who is not against you is for you. We saw some of the people pre pre preaching in your name and we told them to stop because they weren't one of us. You do realize there are other churches in the area. I've passed a few of them as I've driven around here. And you know what? God's using them too, isn't he? But they don't believe it just like we believe it. That's okay. God still can use them. Folks, it's, it's, I can tell you right now, I have seen some of the most conservative, ultra-fundamental, and I think in my mind, legalistic churches, but God uses them. I've seen some others that I'm thinking, man, they're so left-wing and liberal, I don't know if I could even be in, in their parking lot, but you know what? I see God use them. But in our mind, if they're not seeing it like we're seeing it, we told them to stop. And Jesus said, actually, um, if they're not against you, they're for you. Go to the very next verse. Look at verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of some, the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked James and John. And they went on to another village. Now, the ESV doesn't bring this out. Other translations that have a different set of manuscripts, if you look at your notes, some uh, manuscripts in verse 2 add, Jesus said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are. For the Son of Man came not to destroy people's lives, but to save them. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. It was time to go die. And he asked his disciples to go on ahead of him and make preparations in this one Samaritan town so they'd have a place to sleep that night and get ready to go so that when he showed up, if things were in place and prepared. So they, some of the disciples, remember there was always more than the 12 went, and they did that. And the Samaritans, knowing that Jesus was going to Jerusalem, didn't let him stay there. 
James and John said, they need to be judged right now for this horrible thing they've done to Jesus. And they said, do you want us to call fire down on them? And Jesus said, you, your first reaction's wrong. By the way, it might be on the same page as like it is on mine. Go to Matt, uh, Luke chapter 10. Look at verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary's chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Isn't that interesting? Martha, in her zeal, serving the Lord, is convinced that she's in the right and her sister's in the wrong, and she says, Lord, tell my sister to help me. I love how Martha calls Jesus Lord and then bosses him around. You know why? Martha's got a problem. Martha wants to be God. Oh, don't beat up Martha. James and John have a problem. They want to be God. And they want to determine who gets judged when. We don't know which disciples they were, but the ones who said, we told them to stop preaching because they weren't one of us. They had a problem. They wanted to be God. Go to John. Sorry, not John, Matthew chapter 26. John's account of what we're going to look at here, and John's account of Matthew 26, starting in verse 6, John's account makes it look like it was only Judas who had this opinion. And we got no problem having a problem with Judas. But look at verse 6 of Matthew 26. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant. By the way, who was indignant? Was it just, was it just Judas? It was all of them. They were indignant saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. You always have the poor with you, but you'll not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. The disciples were indignant. She's wrong. That was a waste. That's not good stewardship. And they thought they were right. But their first reaction was wrong. And Jesus didn't see it the way they saw it. Not only that, Jesus said she didn't just do a good thing. She did a marvelous, beautiful, awesome thing that should be told from here on out as the gospel's preached. Along with the gospel being preached, what she's done should be told. Folks, every one of us, I hope you're willing to admit this, every one of us most likely our first reaction to what we see is wrong. Do you know why the Bible tells us to, everyone needs to be quick to listen and slow to speak? Does anybody know why the Bible tells us to be quick to listen and slow to speak? If you don't know, I'm going to have you turn there. I'm going to ask you again. Does anybody know why? We know the Bible tells us in the book of James chapter 1 that we are to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Does anybody know why? Close. You're getting close. You're getting to chapter 3. Turn in your Bibles to John 1. I want you to see it. I'm sorry, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Look at verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I know it. You know it. 
there have probably been some issues, and I'm saying probably to be nice, here at Hillcrest with my family. I do consider you my family. I hope you consider us part of your family. We're in your church directory, you better. <laughs> some of you have had some issues with each other over masks. And there might even have been some decisions that have been made by leadership that have gotten some of you angry. Some of you might felt that the decisions weren't done well enough or soon enough. You all have different opinions on this. Let me just say this to you. Chances are your first reaction wasn't how Jesus looks at it. And so tonight, I want to be used of God to show you how Jesus looks at these issues. Go to Romans 14. By the way, as you're turning to Romans 14, have you ever thought about the disciples that Jesus picked? Have you ever really kind of thought about more than Peter, James, and John, and so on? Have you ever thought about that two of the disciples that Jesus picked, one of them was named Matthew. Does anybody remember what Matthew did for a living? He was a tax collector. He was a Jew who worked for the Romans. And there was another guy named Simon. Does anybody remember the rest of his name? He was Simon the what? The Zealot. Does anybody know what the zealots were about? The zealots were a branch of Judaism which hated anyone who supported Rome. They hated being under Romans, Rome's thumb. And the zealots actually were famous for killing people who didn't see things like they did. I've often wondered if when Jesus sent them out two by two to go preach, if he didn't put Matthew and Simon together to go out and preach. And I wonder if that did happen, if Matthew slept with one eye open every night. In Romans 14, look at verse one. Paul says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Let me stop real quick here so you're tracking with me here. Paul is saying there are going to be Christians in the church who don't see things the same way in what we would call disputable matters, opinions about certain things that aren't clearly sin in the scripture. Well, I think it's a sin. Well, that's fine, but that's not clearly sin in the Bible. Just because you see it as a sin doesn't mean that it's a sin for everybody else. And you're going to see that in this passage. Just because you think it's sin doesn't mean it's sin for somebody else. Would we not agree that the Bible teaches that to be drunk is a sin? And I know I'm about to head into waters that you're going to make you uncomfortable. But do we, if we're faithful to the scripture, also not agree that the Bible does teach that to have an actual drink in and of itself is not sin? Let me tell you, for Jim Johnson, though, if Jim Johnson had a drink, it would be sin. Here's why. Because in the role that God has called me to, he has made very clear to my wife and I, so that our, for the purposes of being used of him wherever we go, so that we never cause a brother or sister to stumble, we are not to have alcohol. But if I go into your house and I see something in your fridge, I'm not going to judge you because it's not sin, unless... We see you getting drunk. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know it gives some of you problems. Well, then, but, but, but yeah, but, 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 but then they might have a, become an alcoholic, and I think it's better if they never have a drink. And you've heard all those conversations, haven't you? Did you hear that? I think it's better that, and what happened? That problem that we all have has just reared its ugly head where we want to be God, and we want to determine right and wrong, good and evil. Stick with me, because this passage deals with a whole lot of your questions that might be in your minds right now. Paul said, 
I want you to welcome your brother who doesn't see things like you, but don't welcome him in order to have an argument. Don't welcome him in order to convince him to your side. There are gonna be some that think it's okay to eat all kinds of food. Others are gonna be really uncomfortable with certain things and they'll eat only vegetables to keep for themselves from maybe accidentally, maybe eating food that was sacrificed to idols. You shouldn't look down on the one that sees it differently and you shouldn't judge the one that sees it differently. Listen closely, because God is okay with both of them. Isn't that what I just read? Look at it, look again. In verse three, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for God has welcomed him. And then he makes a very interesting statement. He says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. I'm pretty sure those of you that raise children had somebody once or twice maybe as you were raising your kids make a statement about how you ought to be raising your kids or they might even have tried to correct your kids and tell them how they ought to live and you quickly as mama bear or papa bear said, whoa, 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 those are our kids and that's my responsibility. You're not to raise my kids, I'm to raise my kids. You know what I'm talking about, right? By the way, how do you think Jesus feels when you start telling his children how they ought to live their lives? Be careful. And I'm going to ask you a question I've asked you before, but I want to show of hands. How many of you really believe, Philippians 1, 6, that he who began the good work in you will finish it? I want to show of hands. Keep them up. All right? Look around the room. Look around the room. I really want you to look around the room for here's why. If you believe that God's able to finish what he started in your life, why don't you believe that he's able to finish what he started in the people around you? Why do you think he needs your help? By the way, we preachers have to be really careful. This is an area that I have to intentionally lay my flesh on the altar on a daily basis because I've been given a role to say, thus says the Lord. That's why Paul, a few times, when he makes a very bold statement, he'll always say, by the grace given to me in the role that God's given me, I'm going to make this statement. But I'm also understanding that I'm only making this statement because of the position that I've been given. Not because I'm f- anybody's free to make a statement like this, but I've been given this role. But I also know that in the role that God's given me, there are times that he's shown me things that I'm not supposed to deal with. That's been the trick for me. I've been given the gift of discernment where I can walk into a church and within a half an hour, I can pretty much tell you who the power people are, who are the things things that are going on. The Holy Spirit shows me things. When I was younger, I used to think that that was, he showed me so that I could deal with it. And I caused a lot of damage. And one day God got a hold of me and he said, the church is my bride. Don't you go beat up my bride. I'm going to deal with her. You just, I showed you these things so you know how to pray. And you only speak to what I tell you to speak to when I tell you to speak to it. Otherwise, I'm dealing with it. Those of you who are raising children, aren't, weren't there times that there were things about your kids you knew needed work, but that wasn't what you were working on right now? There were a lot more important things that you were dealing with. You're going to deal with that other stuff. And someone might have pointed out the thing you knew you were going to deal with later on, and you'd say, look, relax, we're going to get to that, but not now. Listen, your Heavenly Father's the same way with each of us. And we need to, in this day, take a deep breath and realize that we got a problem. We want to be God. And what's manifesting itself in the world, and it's going to get worse should not manifest itself in the church. We should love each other and understand that you may not feel the same way I feel, but that doesn't change how I feel towards you because as long, listen closely, and this we're gonna go in this passage, as long as you can look me in the eye and say that you feel the way you feel because the Holy Spirit is leading you to act in that way or to believe in this way at this time, I'm gonna support you. If it's not clearly sin in the Bible, Even though I may think it's sin, but it's not clearly sin in the Bible, I have to trust that the God who began his work in you will finish what he started. And I'm not to judge you, and I'm not to to judge someone else's servant. You belong to the Lord. And I believe that if I'm right, he'll get you to where I see it in time. And I also believe that if I'm wrong, he'll show me. But until then... That's why the Bible actually says in 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must gently instruct in the hopes that God will bring them to an understanding. 
That's why Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says, if on any point you don't see things the same way, God will help you get there. It's not my job to convince you. And so there are going to be times that God may have you, but buddy, you better make sure it's God. God may have you share something with a brother or sister for them to consider, but leave it at that if you even have been freed up to even say that. For the most part, I'm going to tell you, don't even assume that you're ever to tell them something. And here's why. If you did a study of the word or the passages that talk about judge not lest you be judged in the same measure you judge, it'll be judged to you. You'll find that all throughout the scripture. God keeps making that statement. But Jim, aren't we to make judgments about sin? Yes, we are. But the Bible actually says that the ones who are to make the judgments about sin are those who are in leadership and those who are spiritually mature and only the spiritually mature in leadership who have prayed over it before they even say anything in that instance. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, if you see your brother caught in a transgression, listen closely, you who are spiritual, restore them gently. But you better examine yourself first. Make sure your motives are pure before you even say anything. And so, folks, I'm going to encourage you to not think that you have a right to tell anybody else what they ought to be doing and assume that you don't. And when and if God wants to use you, it'll come out of your mouth in a way that is to build up and not to tear down. And it'll be done in a way not only to build up, but in a belief that if what I'm sharing with you is correct, God will help you see it, not me. I've done what he's asked me to do. I'm leaving it. And if you don't agree with me, I still love you. I, I, like I said, you, I told you, I've been praying hard about this message because I know that some of the things that I'm going to be sharing and maybe already have, some of you haven't agreed with or don't like. I hope you understand that I still love you if you don't see it like I do. And I will stand before God one day for everything that I've stood here and said, and I don't take it lightly. I think James chapter 3 says those of us who teach will be held in stricter judgment by God. Do you really want to switch places with me? But we do because we like to tell people how they ought to be living their lives. Look at the next verses. One person esteems one day is better than another while another esteems all days alike. Listen closely. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Remember last night we looked about giving and how giving was never to be under compulsion, but it also was never to be reluctantly. That's going to be important. I pray that the Lord burns that into your heart over and over as you pray over things. God would never want anything to be done in a church under compulsion. Mandatory everybody is not what the Bible teaches whose job is to tell everybody what they're supposed to be doing. By the way, if you don't get this one, we gotta start over. It's God's, it's the Holy Spirit's job. Remember, he's the master of each of us. But at the same time, if you, and you're gonna see this as we get to the end of chapter 14, if you actually are doing it reluctantly and you're not fully convinced, you're not doing it by faith as well. You actually start to really need to start praying over yourself. What is God telling me? And though here's where it gets really tricky. What's God telling me to do in this instance at this time? That's where it gets hard. You see, because some of us have decided that we're going to make a policy, that we're never going to do this, or we're always going to do that. You're not living by the leadership of the Holy Spirit anymore. You're living by your policy. Doesn't the book of Proverbs say that it's a prudent man who sees danger and avoids it? By the way, if you don't know that, there's actually a proverb that says it's a prudent man who sees danger and avoids it. Should we turn that into a policy? Be careful. Because if we want to turn that into a policy, Jesus would have never gone to the cross. Did Jesus not know what was about to happen to him? Yet in that instance, the Spirit of God was compelling him because the Father had a purpose and a plan. We see Paul in Acts chapter 16 take a horrific beating when he could have avoided it. We find out later in chapter 22 when he's being arrested by the Romans and he says, hey, are you guys allowed to, he's tied to the chain, uh, to the post about to be whipped and he says, are you allowed to beat a Roman citizen without a trial? 
When they found out he was a Roman citizen, they quickly backed up. Well, but why didn't Paul pull out the Roman citizen card in Acts 16? He was in a Roman colony of Philippi. He knew about the law. When the magistrates went to release him, he said, you beat us two Roman citizens, me and Silas, without a trial. You need to have them publicly release us. He knew. Why didn't he take the beating? Because he had learned in each situation to let the Spirit show him how he was to live in that situation and at that time. We see the same thing. In one instance, he's dragged outside the city, stoned, left for dead, and he gets back up, walks back in the city. Yet in another instance, in another town, he finds out that they're going to try to kill him, and he sneaks in the basket, out the window, out the wall, and goes off. You see the danger of living by your policy? instead of by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's why we've got to learn in each instance at this time, what is God telling me that I am to do? And then we really quickly want to make a policy for everybody else. And God says, no, no, no. I will talk to them about what I want them to do. You trust me. Keep reading. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse six, the one who observes that day who thinks it's more special than other days, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, listen closely, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. One day, you're gonna stand before Jesus, and you will be judged, not whether or not you get into heaven, but there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says that everything after salvation will be tested by fire. And if it survives the test, we'll be rewarded. If not, we'll suffer loss. And the only things that will be surviving the test are going to be those things that were done by faith and he empowered it. Anything you did in your own strength, in your own wisdom, that you were trying to do for God, it'll be burnt up. It doesn't matter. But even if I believed it strongly and I worked really hard and I was committed, no, it doesn't make a difference. Only what's done by him will be rewarded. And that's why each of us has to learn on a daily basis, again, come to tomorrow or the next night, to find out how to lay our flesh on the altar. We're going to deal with that. Each of us has to learn how to daily say, Lord, today, what would you have me do? You know, my wife and I travel all over the country, and throughout this pandemic, we've had to prayerfully, everywhere we go, pray for wisdom as to how should we go or should we not go? Should we wear a mask? Should we not? By the way, I carry one in my pocket all the time, along with a placard that just jumped out because I don't like things stuck in my teeth. But I keep my mask in my pocket everywhere I go because there are going to be times the Holy Spirit's going to say, throw it on, and I have it ready to go. There's going to be other times he says, you're free to leave it off, and I'll listen, and I'll do it. Folks, let me just tell you, as we, you remember when I was here last year? Do you remember when I was here last year? You guys were in the middle of a, a big peak in a way. You were like number nine in the state. But as we prayed, the Lord told us, go. Hug them, kiss them, don't worry about it. And we had a freedom when we came here, and we did, and enjoyed it. Yet there was another instance where I was going to be speaking at a homeless shelter down in Florida, and I had gotten word that diarrhea was starting to run through this, this uh, homeless shelter, and I was supposed to speak the next night, and I wasn't far from having my left knee replaced. This was in November of last year, and I was trying real hard to stay healthy and clean. I had to pass a COVID test and all this stuff to get my surgery, and I've been preparing for this day, and I sensed in the Holy Spirit speaking to me, he told me to call the chaplain of this homeless shelter, which I've spoken at for 20 years regularly. I've never canceled to call him and to say, I'm not supposed to come. So I called him and I said, Perry, his, his name's Perry. I said, Perry, you know me. I'll have never canceled on you, but I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me I'm not supposed to preach there tomorrow night. He said, that's fine. I don't want you to get sick. And yeah, there is a little diarrhea running through the whole place. And, but, you know, Ingalls, I've even got a little bit of it myself, but I'm fine with it, Jim. By the way, it wasn't diarrhea. 
It was a massive outbreak of COVID-19 to the point that the state health department had to come quarantine the whole property, shut the place down, and that Pat, man Perry that I had talked to on Thursday was in the hospital on Friday and almost died. It was a severe one, but the Holy Spirit in that instance said, don't go. But that doesn't mean that I always stay away to protect myself. I had to learn to let the Spirit teach me. Well, Jim, shouldn't you be prudent? Be careful. When you start using human reasoning to determine what you do and why you do it, you're, you're presuming, and I don't know if many of you know this, but in that famous passage in 1 Samuel 15, where it says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, the very next part of that verse says, and presumption is as idolatry. When you make a decision with your own wisdom and what you think is best, you are presuming and making a presumption. And the Bible says God sees that as idolatry. Why? I think we just read it. He wants to be the Lord of each of us. So you've got to learn how to listen to the Spirit on a daily basis. And the Christian response is, sometimes God's going to tell you to mask up. Sometimes he's going to tell you, take it off. And you're going to have to learn how to listen. That's the danger of making everybody has to do the same thing. A statement. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're taking away the leadership of the Holy Spirit in individuals' lives. But we also need to keep in mind that in this size of a congregation, there's going to be some that certain feel a certain way and others, and they're both going to be right. And we have to make possibility so that those who feel uncomfortable or those who feel comfortable or whichever way have the opportunity to do what it is that God's told them to do. And we don't look down on anyone that sees it one way or another. I was preaching this, by the way, um, about... I don't know, about a month ago or less, at a men's conference. This man comes up to me afterwards and he says, Are you, have you had the vaccine? And I know where he's coming from. He's one of these anti-vaxxers. And I said, no, not yet. He goes, well, good, because you're not supposed to. I said, hang on for a second. I just finished preaching on Romans 14. When did you become my Lord? When did you become my Lord? My wife and I prayed about this, and at the beginning of the pandemic, he made very clear to us that we're to wait. When other people are nervous and panicked about it, and everybody was scrambling to try to get a shot, the Holy Spirit told us, leave it alone. Let them go. Let them have their opportunity. But that doesn't mean we weren't ever to do it. We're to listen. And I said to him, I said, actually, the Lord has told us, because we're about to go on a three-week trip all over the U.S., and there might be some churches that are uncomfortable if we're not vaccinated in other places. And we just really feel like the Lord's told us at this point that we are actually to get the vaccine. Now, some of you have already made a judgment about me. So my wife and I, this was on a Tuesday, I'm speaking at the men's conference. My wife and I, the day before on that Monday, had actually gone to go get the first of two shots. But as we're about to get the shot, I told the doc, I said, hang on for a second. I said, we're about to be on a long trip and we won't be back in town when it's time for the second dose. He goes, oh, then you can't get the shot because we won't even be here giving the second dose by the time you get back. So I shared this with this man who thought I wasn't supposed to get vaccinated. And I said, and to be honest with you, the Lord's not only told us that we're to do it, we tried to yesterday and we weren't able to, but we're still going to. He goes, no, that's God telling you you're not supposed to do it. I'm like, he speaks to us as we pray. He doesn't use circumstances, especially when they don't line up with what he's telling us in our heart. And then I said, and to be honest with you, God has spoken to us and told us at this time why he wants us to do it. And God actually wonderfully, miraculously worked it out that she and I got to get the J&J &J one shot done and, and it worked out wonderfully and we could go into wherever we went and they say, have you been vaccinated? We've been vaccinated. Okay, you can come speak here. And not only that, I told him there's a selfish reason that I think God's let us have because he does know our hearts and our desires and he gives us our desires when we delight ourselves in him. And I said, my wife's a travel agent and we love to cruise and she knows full well that once those cruise ships open up, if you don't have a vaccine, you ain't getting on one and we want to cruise. You ready for what he says next? He says, oh, well, that makes sense. I said, hang on for a second. 
You started this whole thing by I'm in sin because I'm getting vaccinated when God says I'm not supposed to and I'm not trusting him in the way he's made my body to take care of itself and all this human reasoning that you have. And the moment I say, well, here's what he told us. Oh, okay. You can't play both sides. You either be fully convinced or you're not. I said, but I'm going to tell you, you came up here to tell me that I was sinning. And I'm going to show you that you're sinning by coming up here and having this conversation with me. He said, how's that? Go to Romans 14, verse 22. The faith that you have or what you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. Folks, if we felt like the Holy Spirit told us it would be sin for us to have a vaccine and we did it, we'd be sinning. Were we sinning by having a vaccine? Nah. But if he told us not to, we'd be sinning. You need to know what God's told you and listen what he's told you right now some of you have had the flu shot every year it's what i do but maybe some of you who have learned how to do this walking in the spirit thing know that there are times the spirit says have this one you don't need it this year and you know how to listen to the spirit but do you hear what verse 22 said what you believe about these things even if you're fully convinced in your own mind you're to do what with it keep it to yourself Well, I don't get to be God that way. Right. You're not God. He is. And he's actually going to allow differences of opinion amongst Christians for his glory. You know what I realized years ago? This goes way, way back. Some of you might remember this. Some of you might not. But years and years ago, the the baseball World Series ended up between the New York Yankees and the New York Mets. They called it the Subway Series. All the teams had to do was just go back and forth to each other's fields. This is many years ago. And God brought a picture to my mind about the Subway Series. He he brought to my mind, imagine you're sitting on a subway and you're heading to one of the ball games. It's either at the Yankee Stadium or at the Mets Stadium. And across from you on the subway are two absolute best friends who are laughing with each other, hugging each other, high-fiving each other, so excited to go to this game. But one of them's wearing a Yankees uniform and one's wearing a Mets uniform. And you're sitting there watching these two people that do not agree when it comes to which team's the better team, but they love each other. And if you were to ask one, which is the better team? He'd say, well, the Yankees are the better team. I don't even know how the Mets even made it to the World Series. That's because their division is so poor. The Yankees are the best team. Well, you ask the other guy, which is the best team? He goes, oh, the Mets are the best team. Because the Yankees, they're like a minor league team in my mind. I don't even know how they even made it to the World Series. And, And you sit there and you go, these two people do not even come close to agreeing on this one issue. Why do they love each other? They love baseball. And their love for baseball and their love for each other was manifested in the fact that they didn't see things the same way, yet still loved each other. My prayer for Hillcrest is not that everybody in this place all sees it the same way. My prayer for Hillcrest is that when some of you may see things a certain way and others may see things another way, that what is seen by those outside these walls is that you love each other and you forgive each other in the same way that the Lord has forgiven you know what God's told you and hang on to what he's told you passage even I don't have time to get into it tonight because I want to let you out the passage even says don't let what you believe strongly be spoken bad against know what it is you believe but also I'm going to tell you be ready if he says later on but I want you to do this now because it's a daily walk with the Lord. And I'm just going to challenge you and I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit take it from here. If there has been any ill will that has come up through this whole mess, 
that you get it settled as soon as possible. Because the Bible says, if you got a problem with your brother and you try to come worship at the altar, you just better leave your gift at the altar. It's going to waste your time to be worshiping until you go make things right with your brother. And here's how you go make things right with your brother or your sister. You say, I've been angry at you. I've thought bad things. I might even have said bad things about you because you didn't see it like I saw it or you made decisions that I didn't like. But I've come to realize today that that's God's job to get you and me where we're supposed to be. And the, in the meantime, I'm to focus on mutual upbuilding and love. And you know what? Even though we may not see it the same way, I like you. Actually, I love you. I see James sitting there with his arm around his wife. I think I'm right. Do you guys always 100% agree? No. I'm pretty sure that most of the time she sees it one way and you see it another. That's how most marriages are. But <laughs> she's not the Holy Spirit. Don't change my whole sermon here now. So. But you have committed to each other. And that supersedes the disagreements. And that's what keeps you together in the midst of those times where you don't see things the same way, correct? You've made a vow. You've made a commitment to God till death do us part. And even in those times where we don't see it the same, we'll never divorce. The Bible says that we've become family in Jesus Christ. Never to be separated. Is God ever gonna leave us? Well, that means that we're always gonna be family, no matter what. Let that drive how you handle times when you don't see it the same way and rest in a big God. As we close tonight, let me just say this to you. I've been nervous and prayerful over this message because I know that there are going to be some people that don't like some things that I said. But you know what I've got to rest in? The same thing that I'm telling you to rest in. If you're ever to see it like I see it, God's going to do it, it not me. And if you disagree... As long as you still love me, I'll still love you, and everything's going to be okay. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you again for this chance to come and allow you to speak to us from your word. Father, there's so much more here still in this passage in Romans 14. But Lord, I believe that for now you've shown me that this is as far as you want me to go. Thank you, Lord, that you will continue to show us how we're to take it from here in mutual upbuilding and love and unity because of Christ. Lord, I thank you that there has been a love in this place over the years that has manifested itself. And I pray that it continues to grow and grow and grow until the time we're all in heaven and we find out who was right. And we also probably find out that in the times that one saw it one way and another saw it another way, we were both right at that time. Father, may we rest in that and the fact that you aren't worried about some of this stuff because you've already written the end of the book. You already know how it all plays out. And when Peter was about to deny he even knew you, you lovingly called him by his new name because you saw the finished product. May we lovingly see the finished product in each of us in those times when we look like Simon, when we're already Peter. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. We'll see you tomorrow night.